Delighted to be here today with Sir Stephen Wall, who will be delivering the keynote speech at our Max Weber Fellows June Conference, entitled Britain and the European Union Lessons from a Small Island. By means of a very short introduction, Sir Stephen has had a distinguished career in the British diplomatic service, acting as private secretary to numerous foreign secretaries and Prime Minister John Major, before becoming the British permanent representative to the EU and EU advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair. He is currently the official historian at the Cabinet Office, writing the official history of Britain's relationship with the rest of the European Union. So we couldn't have a more qualified person to speak to the current issues taking place with respect to Britain's relationship with the EU with the impending referendum. With this issue in mind, I'll turn to my first question, which is to draw on Hugo Young's book, um, in which he tells us that Britain's relationship with, the, with Europe is the story of 50 years in which Britain struggled to reconcile the past she could not forget with the future she could not avoid. Would you say that this is still an accurate assessment of the British debate in the context of the referendum? Uh, yes, I think, I think in a word, I think Hugo, Hugo Young got it spot on and he was quoted in one of the British newspapers just the other day uh, with the referendum very much uh, in mind. And I actually, I was at a dinner last night with Radek Sikorski, the former Polish foreign minister, and he made exactly this point really, that for every single member state of the European Union, apart from Britain joining the European Union, was the path to success out of failure. Whereas for Britain, it was a sort of admission of failure. Uh, our role as a great power, as an imperial power, had ended and we had to reconcile ourselves to a lesser place in the world and so we joined reluctantly. And that reluctance, I think, has been the feature of British membership uh, throughout. So with that sense of a historical perspective, I, I was interested to know whether you view Britain as being more Eurosceptic today than when you were working in Brussels and whether indeed we're in the shadow of the rise of Donald Trump and populist politics in various parts of Europe do you believe that the British referendum is something very particular to Britain and Europe, and is it indeed even about Europe itself? Well, it's a good question, because I think it's a mixture of, of, of a lot of things. I mean, I lived through two periods in Brussels. The first was the last year or so of John Major's uh, government, where we were negotiating what became the Amsterdam Treaty. And I remember having a conversation with my colleague who was then running the European Secretariat uh, for Coordinating Policy back in London, and we agreed that if, unexpectedly, John Major were to rid win that election in 1997, uh, the first question we would have to ask him was, is there anything in the Amsterdam Treaty that you can actually accept? Because at that stage, the politics of the Conservative Party, as now, were very, uh, were very sceptical. And then, of course, under Tony Blair, things shifted, and we had a, a, a brief period of, of sunlit uplands. Um, uh, but then that got mired in internal Labour Party politics, and in particular the, r the rivalry between Blair and, uh, and Brown. So I think there's a mixture of things going on. I mean, I think there's quite a lot of, about this referendum which is very similar to political trends we see elsewhere in Europe. Um, the, the rise of far-right parties, which in itself is a, is a response to people feeling that their lives are threatened. They're, they feel threatened economically, uh, the near collapse of the capitalist system in 2007, 2008, uh, the rise of, of a kind of terrorism which is particularly scary. Uh, disappointment uh, in uh, in elites, and a, a way in which social media create different political groupings, all of those things, and I think a lot of what's going on in Britain is the feeling, this is all too difficult, let's go in inside the house, close the front door against uh, against the world, and that's, that's, I mean, you see that par excellence with, with Trump, you know, let's build a wall to keep out the Mexicans, it's a very... It's very, uh, it's very similar, but there are peculiar. There are particularly British European echoes in that quite a lot of this debate is about regaining sovereignty, and loss of sovereignty was always an issue when we first uh, when we first joined, as well as the usual British um, thing of having endless nostalgia for a, for a past that may have existed or may not have existed. Uh, yeah, um, Susan Strange, who I, I draw on a lot, once wrote of the Commonwealth myth and the um, post-imperial implications of a monetary policy in Europe. So I, I'm uh, particularly interested in that historical... The Commonwealth, I mean, the Commonwealth myth hasn't actually uh, raised its head. It has bit, and I even, that somehow the Commonwealth provides an alternative to, uh, to the European Union. 
But you know, when you point out to people that we sell twice as much by value to Belgium as we do to India, the Commonwealth of England fades a uh, bit. Plus, you know, if you look at human rights uh, standards, the European Union is an exemplar of human rights standards. Uh, the Commonwealth is not. Mm. And so, so I, I'd like to turn a bit to something that I know you have particular experience with, which is working with Labour leaders in the European context. So to first learn something about your experience with, uh, with Blair and Brown, and then um, if, to, to look at Jeremy Corbyn's role. So um, first, what was it like to work with Blair and Brown on European issues in, in that moment of, op of op optimism, perhaps? And then um, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn, do you feel that he's delivered a clear enough message in the referendum? Because obviously there's much in the press about him being ambivalent or equivocal, but what's your view on those? I think, well, Tony Blair was the first Prime Minister in a long time who had no hang-ups about uh, Europe. And of course, he had a very large majority in the House of Commons. And for him, you know, Europe had always been part of his, uh, of his life. Uh, except that he first stood for Parliament in 1983 when the Labour Party were campaigning to come out of Europe. But it was, I remember him saying, this was a rather salutary lesson, because on the doorstep, campaigning, he found that people didn't actually think this was a, a good thing. But he wanted Britain to be wholeheartedly at the centre of policy in Europe. That said, I mean, his view of European policy making was pretty intergovernmental. I mean, he basically thought that the French, Germans and British should run it. Uh, mm. And it, when I used to talk to him about the role of the Commission or you know, the European Parliament and the other institutions, he'd kind of look at me as if I was a halfwit. Um, uh, in a nice kind of way, but you know, nonetheless, it didn't that didn't sort of register to him as being as being really relevant. And he never, uh, partly because he'd never been in ministerial office before he became prime minister. The only bit of the European Union on which he was focused was the European Council. So all that, all the work of what used to be the European Community, I mean, community business, the making of laws, all that stuff kind of passed him by. So he didn't really kind of realise how important that was. That that was actually, in many ways, more important than. A lot of the time than what was going on in the European, in the European Council. Now, I mean, his his wish to take Britain into the Euro fell foul of a number of things, including obviously the opposition of, uh, of Gordon Brown. I mean, to say that I worked with Gordon Brown would be uh, an exaggeration. Um, some of my colleagues in Brussels asked me once what my relationship was like with my finance minister, and I said I have a really good relationship with Gordon Brown, such that. Um, if I, he arrives in Brussels and I say to him, good morning, Chancellor, on about one in ten occasions, he might actually reply. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I sat next to him at the council table. I don't think he ever asked for my advice on a single occasion. Now, you know, I'm not particularly literate economically, but there were some political things and some negotiating things where I could have uh, helped him. Um, and so it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy, and I think officials working for him didn't find it easy. And... I don't think any of us really appreciated at the time how much he was eaten up, I don't think it's too strong a phrase, with his desire to basically to replace Tony Blair as the Prime Minister. And I think that wasn't the sole that wasn't the sole reason behind his his attitude to the to the, to the Euro. But he had been very pro Euro in opposition and became progressively less so. And I think at least part of that was the feeling if this is going to be done, it's going to be done by me and by nobody else. As regards Jeremy Corbyn, I, I mean, I don't know Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, I think you know Jeremy Corbyn's political history is one where he is, is built on a pretty strong dislike of the of most of the institutions of Western politics, from NATO to the to the uh, to the European Union, um, and to an extent, he's had his feet held to the fire a bit by his MPs in Parliament, who are, for the large part, very uh, pro-European. On the other hand, I think. Actually, for somebody in this campaign to say, look, you know, I'm not that keen on it, but I think it's necessary not least to preserve the kind of social agenda in terms of the, the laws that the European Union has passed to protect workers' rights. I think that probably is not an ineffective way of, 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 of appealing to people. Um, certainly, the kind of uh, focus group research done by the Remain campaign suggests that people who, are make, who make a more emotional case for Europe don't resonate or haven't so far resonated with the electorate. I've just got a follow-up question which intrigued me in, in one thing you said, which is that Blair had a particularly intergovernmental image of the EU, and something that I've seen uh, from a historical perspective is Thatcher's argument that she didn't understand the single European Act and she didn't appreciate the implications of that, and that resulted in this kind of transition in the middle of her term towards a more Eurosceptic position or still more Eurosceptic position, but do you think that that's a particular characteristic of British politicians? Or when you work with, con with other European politicians, do you sense a more 
Federalist and a, um, a greater appreciation of the Federalist features. Of well, I think there's been a sort of transition over time. I mean, I think Margaret Thatcher slightly rewrote history in terms of her own attitude. I mean, at the time that and I, I was involved as a kind of backroom boy when the Single European Act was being negotiated in 1985, and the senior official advising her was David Williamson, who later became Secretary General of the uh, of the European Commission. And I remember David telling us that you know he'd gone to Number Ten one day, and Margaret Thatcher had waiting for Margaret Thatcher at the foot of that famous staircase in Downing Street, and she came down clutching the treaty, you know, sort of like this, and she said, I've read every word, I've read every word. And she had read every word. And of course, you know, reluctantly, very reluctantly, she accepted majority voting. The biggest increase in majority voting we've ever had in the history of the European community or European Union, because she knew that was the only way that you could actually get over, you know, the constant vetoes which were uh, blocking progress. So she knew what the implications of that, of that were. I think where she did undergo a transformation was in her views of Jacques Delors, because she knew Jacques Delors well from his time as French finance minister, and she rated him very highly because of basically turning around the French economy, persuading Mitterrand to adopt different policies and policies which were closer in many ways uh, to her own. So I don't think she quite expected uh, Jacques Delors to be quite such an integrationist as, as, as he actually was as president of the commission, and I think that was probably more of a, uh, of a factor than, uh, than anything else. So speaking to some of those issues where Europe's perhaps progressed further than, than Britain might have been comfortable with, although enlargement's a complicated one politically, um, I'd like to just ask you about some of the contemporary issues mm, sure. in Europe today. So the first being the issue of enlargement and whether you think from your time in Brussels or uh, whether there's any truth in the claim that Europe is now too big to run and whether you can see that there's a limit to European enlargement, and if so, what that might be? I think it's, I mean, I, th I think it's very difficult to set limits in terms of you know, what, the, what the Treaty of Rome says about if you are a European uh, country and you, know, you can fulfill the criteria, uh, then, you can, uh, then you can join. Now, of course, you can have a, you know, you can have a, a debate, and people do have a debate about what the geography of, of Europe is, and to an extent, people had that debate about Turkey, although, from my perspective, that debate was resolved by those who were members of the European Union at the time, who said in the 1960s that you know that Turkey could, in due course, um, uh, apply to uh, apply to join. And certainly, I mean, I think you know the attitude. I mean, Margaret Thatcher. One of the one of the things which I think is a great passage in the in Margaret Thatcher's Bruges speech is when she says, "Let us never forget that Warsaw, Prague, and Budapest are also great European cities." And it was dismissed at the time as, "There go the Brits. They want to widen the whole thing, so they, you know, it'll it'll not." But what she was basically saying was, and it was also John Major's policy and Tony Blair's, you know, we, the countries that have benefited from peace and prosperity, cannot say to these newly dem democratizing countries who've shed the yoke of you know, Soviet tyranny, we can't say to them, sorry guys, we've got our club of the wealthy and you cannot join. And I think that's one of the, I think that's, I think that is the European Union's greatest achievement, that, you know, piece by piece, country by country, we have built stability and peace and prosperity across a continent that was, you know, where, well, one of my friends has made, a, made herself a badge uh, which says 28 million reasons for voting to remain. And the 28 million reasons are that in the 28 countries of the European Union over two world wars, 28 million people died. And that's very powerful. So although the successive British governments thought that one of the consequences of enlargement would be that the kind of pressure for integration would diminish and that was welcome to them. That wasn't the, that wasn't the prime uh, motivation. I think where we made a mistake possibly, and it was very difficult in the first wave of the enlargement to Eastern and Central Europe, but we perhaps got it slightly wrong with Romania and Bulgaria, was not being as insistent on people meeting the conditions before joining. Um, and I think that does create, uh, that does create difficulties and I think that these are the other Africans, including particularly at the moment Turkey, given the way that Turkey is going. We've got to be absolutely rigorous. I mean, I think the politics in, you know, in Germany and France, better than anywhere else, will dictate that. But I think we have got to be absolutely rigorous that countries do have to meet the criteria before they can join. And I think, realistically, as regards freedom of movement, you know, we're, going to, we're going to see longer, longer transition periods than we've ever seen before. So the, the second issue I wanted to speak to, which uh, is the Eurozone, and obviously another setting where strains being put on existing rules and in the existing institutions, and um, this is an area that I work on more directly, and, and in my view, ultimately, it, the Eurozone will necessitate some form of fiscal and political union to manage the distributional implications of sharing a single currency, which we've seen. And to be rather provocative uh, in, in posing this question, 
do you think that, that, that a British exit could ease the path to a fiscal union, or do you think it's a very independent question? Well, I, I, I don't think it will. I mean, I think it will be an impetus for an, an effort to be made towards further integration, including possibly fiscal integration, um, building on you know, the, the Merkel alarm letter and the Vice President's report, although I think substantively, I don't know what you feel, but I think substantively we're not likely to see anything happen probably in, in advance of the French or, or, or German elections. But if you think back, I mean, if you think back to the Maastricht Treaty, because Britain was opted out, we weren't the obstacle to those who wrote the Maastricht Treaty doing what they needed to do, which was, which was as you say. But, I mean, Margaret Thatcher argued at the time, she said, you know, the, the only way a single currency can work is if you have, as in a member state, you have fiscal transfers from the rich regions to the poor regions. And if you've got lots of countries, that can only happen if you have a political union. Now, for her, that political union wasn't acceptable. And I think the problem was that, you know, the, the end was... Uh, was willed, but not the means, and that's still the dilemma. And I mean, you'd be more expert on this than me, but I mean, it just seems to me that the, that intention, which has to be the right intention to make the eurozone work, comes up against national politics, be it in Greece or Germany or, or wherever. And I, my worry is, you know, as somebody who wants it to succeed, um, is that the kind of muddling along scenario will prevail rather than the kind of getting into clear blue water scenario. Mm -hmm. I think we share that worry, I'd yeah. like to say. Um, so turning to an issue, uh, the, the third big issue really in the Eurozone and, and the most recent to emerge, the migrant crisis and the failure of the Schengen Agreement. And my question to, is really, what do you think that tells us about Europe today? And uh, what the implications might be of, uh, of, that, of, the, of the crisis and, and efforts to resolve it? Well, I think it says uh, two things really. One is that at the, at the end of the day, you know, we are 28, separate countries, uh, each with our domestic uh, uh, politics, and the political and practical implications of a refugee crisis of the kind we, we've never seen in, our, in our, most of our lifetimes was overwhelming in every, in, in every sense. And I think that um, you, you, know, you can argue credibly that um, the collective reaction was slow and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and indecisive, and you know, there were issues there in terms of the relationship between the rest of the EU and Greece, and Greece's willingness to accept help, etc., etc., etc. That seems to me not. To, I don't think that myself. I don't myself feel that's a failure of the European Union because it was kind of beyond the power of the institutions, as it were, to to deal with. I mean, and insofar as it has been a failure, it's uh, a failure of the ability of governments to exercise the necessary uh, leadership. But. Without the framework of the European Union, I think we'd have gone much faster towards some of the bad things we have seen. Um, and you know, thanks to, in large measure, I believe, to the leadership of, of Donald Tusk, you know, we, we've got to a, to a, to a more coherent, uh, coherent policy. But I, you know, if you look at what's, what's happening on the Italian and Austrian border, that seems to me to show to show what I always, I always felt in the five years I had sat around the negotiating table in Brussels, I felt every time I was there, I felt this isn't, this isn't an organization that's about to turn into a single country called Europe. It's a fragile organization of it, then 15, uh, 15 countries who do remain fiercely nationalistic. And, and you know, if we were all nice people, we wouldn't need the European uh, Union. Uh, and that, that part of the argument is completely missing, really, from the debate in Britain at the moment, where we, where people think it'll all go on, you know, everything will go on merrily, and we'll have a wonderful relationship, etc., etc. And I think that's quite quickly right. Mm. So actually, my my final two questions stand back a little and speak to where you finished there. The first one being, so so for me, there's always been a tension in the fact that Europe's goal, with state goal, is ever closer union, which is in the sense a process. Um, but it never defines itself as having a clear outcome. And one thinks of the state-building proje projects of the 19th century, where the goal was to create nation-states, where, whereas Europe's never committed to a clear end state in that sense. And I wondered if, from a historian's perspective, you think that that's a weakness or a strength? And I know that my question leads towards saying it might be a weakness, but I'd be interested to know from your perspective. I think it was a recognition by you know Monet and others of a political reality, and while there's no doubt you know Monet hoped that uh, had very clear hopes of where the of where the direction would uh, would end up. I mean, it was you know it was building uh, a stage at a time. 
And I can remember you know, Mitterrand saying when, when people contrasted British policy and French policy, I mean, he said, well, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a stonemason and you're building a wall, you may, you may think you're only building a wall or you may think you're building a cathedral, but you are engaged on the same process and you can only do it brick by brick. I mean, that sort of metaphor breaks down after a, a time, but you get the, you get the, uh, you get the point. So I, I, think, I, I think in a way to hope that it had been done something, done in a different way, uh, is rather uh, futile. And if you think about uh, the French relationship with with Europe, you know, that within a year of the Treaty of Rome, you have De Gaulle coming into power, who didn't really believe in the institutional structure, but kind of was obliged to accept it, and then you know took France out of it for you know through for six months and so on. There's always been that. There's always been that tension there. And I think you know, I come back to the to the Maastricht Treaty. The Maastricht Treaty was actually the moment when. Countries that really, really, they really, really wanted it. They could have gone further than they than they did, but their own political reality uh, wasn't going to allow that to uh, to happen. And I think that we're going to continue to have that tension between the fact that we have a kind of European demos, but it's not it's not a federal it's not a federal uh, demos, and that has to live coexist really with national politics. Mm. And so I, I think my last question will come back to the referendum and the consequences of the, uh, the possibility of a British vote to leave. And to, to take your, your, the title of your talk today, so what do you think the consequences would be for both our small island and, uh, and Europe itself more broadly? I think, I mean, I think it would be very damaging for us, uh, the British, from all points of view. I think it would be, I mean... You know, you can argue about the figures, and obviously nobody knows what the, exactly what the economic consequences would be because nobody's ever done it before. But when you've got every responsible economic organisation saying there will be a real hit, and when you think about the uncertainty that will go on for years, not only the uncertainty of building a new relationship between Britain and her former partners, but if you think of the consequences in terms of British politics, uh, which could be very, very far-reaching, far-reaching within the Conservative Party if David Cameron resigns, far-reaching in terms of the structure of the United Kingdom, far-reaching as between Britain and Ireland, if there has to be a border controls between the Republic and Northern Ireland, all of those things. Plus, um, the one thing that if we vote to leave, we will have uh, wished away without a second thought is basically, and this is the point that, again, Sikorsky was making at this thing I was at last night, you know, what, what, what are you British about to do to f the 500 years that you spent trying to prevent the consolidation of power by, on, on the continent of Europe. You're throwing that away. You're throwing away uh, your access to the levers of power uh, within, within Europe. So I think from our point of view, I can't see a single uh, advantage. From the point of view of the European Union, and I think the European Union will survive, I think it will cause difficulties because obviously it will give encouragement to what I think, you know, from my perspective, are nasty right-wing movements in quite a lot of the member states that, I, you know, from my, from my political perspective, I wouldn't want to. Uh, I wouldn't want to see uh, encouraged. And I think you know when a country like Britain, which is a great democracy, removes itself from what has been the principal organ of uh, political stability and the spread of democracy in Europe, and obviously that is bad for the that's bad for the organisation as a as a whole. And I think that's the other factor. It seems to me that it would it would be a, a, a almost criminal act of irresponsibility for us to to do it. But this doesn't really feature in in the maybe it will in the last two weeks hasn't really featured. Uh, in the public debate so far. So Stephen, thank you very much for your time. Thank it's you. Fantastically interesting. And I look forward to hearing more from you later. Great. Thanks, Thanks a lot.